Mother Knows Death, starring Nicole and Jemmy and Maria QK. Welcome to Mother Knows Death. It's an exciting day over here because we are launching our merchandise line. We have two new shirts that Maria and I are wearing today. If you guys are on YouTube, I am wearing my Dora Mater shirt, which is a drawing of my hand complete with my tattoos holding a scalpel blade that says Dora Mater, which translates in Latin to tough mother. And I, we kind of flip-flopped this week, so I'm wearing the t-shirt you were wearing last week that says Mortuai Vivos Docent, which means the dead teach the living, and that's a phrase we use a lot over here. So we're really excited about these two new designs. By the time you guys are hearing this episode, the store will be live. You can visit doramoder.shop to shop this exclusive limited edition collection. These will only be on sale for a couple days, and once the store closes, they are done. They will never be available again. So... Don't miss out because we promise they will never be available again. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. So with that said, let's Let's get get started with the story of the week. Kate Middleton, the name on everyone's lips. Let's talk about some (laughs) updates. So I've personally been holding back on a lot of my theories because I'm absolutely consumed with this. I know you probably don't care at all, but I've always just had this fascination with the royals and the story is just setting me through the I, roof i don't want to say that i i don't care because it is definitely interesting what is going on i just keep thinking like what the hell are these people thinking but i'm definitely not as interested at talking about it all day every day like you are so and i know so many of you aren't either so we don't want to flood you with it every week but we have an important update at least with her medical care to talk about but go ahead okay so back in january we reported that she had a quote planned abdominal surgery which you were speculating could be various different things right yeah i think that they did say that it wasn't a cancerous thing but that that doesn't exclude anything for me because she could have an infectious process she could have had a benign process going on she could have had something like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, anything like that. So there's there's a million things that could go wrong inside your abdomen. So abdominal surgery is is not is is just too vague for me to even guess on. But in this press release, this is where things start getting interesting. They say she wasn't going to be back until Easter, which is next week. It's next Sunday, ten days from today, on March thirty first. So. This is January, so everybody's speculating, like, what surgery could be so intense that she's going to be out for about three months, right? So things start going downhill because of the total press mismanagement of Buckingham Palace. So just little tidbits start trickling out, like, William released this public statement, and for the first time since he's been single, before he was married to Kate, it was signed just William. So people started being like, that's really weird, because they've been out before she's given birth and there's been other illnesses and deaths where they haven't been together so why all of a sudden are his press releases just his name and then this this alleged picture of kate surfaces and people are questioning whether they think it's her and not only does the face not 100 percent look like her i don't know if we talked about this photo before on the podcast but you were saying her face could be swollen in the picture her mole's not there it was a very grainy picture my biggest thing was in one of the photos of her in the car, the tire is um, silver, and in a second picture of the car, it's black. So and are, aren't the bricks different in, well, that in was, the window, Well, that too? was another picture that came out later. So then people are like, something weird's going on. And then, you know, they released this Happy Mother's Day picture, which is totally AI generated. And now this picture's come out where they believe the stand-in is with the kids. And I'm thinking... How are these children taking a picture with a stranger (laughs) that they're then photoshopping their mother into? And then, so the internet goes crazy with that. And then after that, another picture of her in a car on the way to an appointment, allegedly, comes out. And the bricks in the window of the car are different than the bricks on the building. So it's like, who is in charge of this sloppy Photoshop work? It's really, really easy to edit pictures of this nature but it's really obvious and and some of these photos were officially released by the palace it's yeah. not just tabloid pictures which i think is the weirdest part because you should know if you work at the palace and you're dealing with the public that you're under a microscope and you should always be 
just doing a little bit extra before you post something on social media to say, how can people dissect this photo and say that it's wrong? Because that's what people do on social media. Yeah. So, you know, speculation has been going crazy. I had said earlier, I thought it was a Shelly Miscavige situation. I think I accidentally mistakenly called her the founder's wife. She's not, she's not L. Ron Hubbard's wife. She is the guy running its wife. Anyway, so Back to the hospital. So the London Clinic, which is where she got her alleged surgery, which nobody knows if in fact she did or not because there's absolutely no footage of her going in and out of the hospital, but there's always footage of them going in and out of there for appointments. Somebody has tried to access her medical records that works there. (laughs) My question for you, having been a hospital employee, can you access anybody's records in any department or did it have to be somebody working in the department in which her surgery took place? Well, that's a good question, Maria. (laughs) So I can only speak to what happens in America because I've only worked in American hospitals, but we have something called HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And when we start working at the hospital, we have to take all this continuing education the entire time we work at the hospital, as well as get educated before we even start working there about patient privacy. And I've worked in the hospital where we've had really high profile, famous people come in and get things done. And it's done in a very specific way, at least the places that I have worked, the the quote VIP patients, they get fake names and you would never even like if they don't want you to know that they're there, they can really limit it to whoever is directly in charge of taking care of them is the one that has access to their records. So if a specimen came down to the lab, we might have a pathologist come in and say like, hey, this is a really important person, but their name would never, ever be on the specimen. That's just stupid right there, right? And this is this is before phones were even a thing and having a camera in your pocket was ever even a thing. So yeah, yes, Technically, I could go in the computer and look up anybody's record, but we're told if you do that, you're getting fired because there's no reason that I need to look up anybody's record if I'm not directly involved in their care, if that makes any sense, because this trickles into, all right, it might not be Kate Middleton, but it might be your next door neighbor and you're nosy as to why she was in your hospital and it's none of your damn business. So Uh, Sometimes, and I've gotten specimens in surgical pathology on people that I know, actually on people that you know and people that my best friends know, but I would never say anything because that's between what I'm doing and, and that person. That person probably doesn't even know I touched their specimen, right? But you, you're not supposed to be looking up stuff unless you need to. Now, There's times that I would get a specimen like a colon resection or something and I would see something weird and I'd have to go into their chart to be like, all right, what's going on here? Because we only get a slip of paper with a person and it might just say, oh, colon resection, that's it on the entire paper. And you're like, okay, well, what the hell did you cut this out for? What are you thinking? But a lot of times they just don't give you that information. So I would go in the computer and go into their chart and look up like what imaging they had done, what are the doctors thinking and stuff like that. And that's okay. Now, in a situation with Kate Middleton, like they probably sit down to everybody and say, listen, if if you do this, you're getting fired. It's a big it's a big no, no. And it's probably on a very need to know basis of who is in charge of those things. And if she had surgery, there's a probability that a piece of Whatever they cut out or whatever they did could have gotten sent to surgical pathology. I'm not sure, but they keep it very limited to who's allowed to be in charge of that stuff. Can we circle back to when you talked about you got a specimen from somebody you know and then you can't say anything to them? Do you have weird thoughts when you see them in person next? Like no, I've had I your just... organ in my hand. <laughs> No, I just like it's it's just it's just my job. Like I I don't I don't look at it like that. I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable and say like, "Hey, are you okay?" I honestly that breaks HIPAA right there if you even say anything to be honest. Um Yeah. So I just I just kind of cut it off. It's just it's not necessary. I did the same thing I would do with any other specimen and that's just the end of the story. But 
Yeah, it, so I don't know how things are in England, but I know this hospital's had some really high-profile people. Apparently, JFK was diagnosed with Addison's yeah. disease there. Uh, one of our friends had their surgery there. So it's it's like a really legit hospital. And it's funny because last week when we were driving in the car talking about this, if you remember, before this story even came out, I was like, yo, that's pretty awesome that they were able to get th- these hospital staff to not say anything about this because I can't believe the amount of money one of these people that are making 40 grand a year low-level employee could get paid to tell a a tabloid this story. I'm pretty sure you said that on the show when we first reported it. I might have. Like, I just just thought, I just think it's, I I thought it was awesome. I was trying to give people, like, credit for being decent human beings. And, and of course, um, another thing that I want to mention is that I had access to all of the, the patient's charts because I was a higher level uh, employee that did that needed that access. But someone like even the people that were that were hired in the lab as assistants to put specimens in the computer, like accession specimens, some of them didn't have full access of people's charts. They might only be able to go in and just see their address or something like that, whereas I could see every single MRI, imaging, uh, tests that were ordered, diagnosis and everything like that. So it depends on what level of an employee you are and what access you need. So I'm just telling you this. It's not like a cafeteria employee went in there and found out anything. It had to be somebody like a nurse or a doctor, somebody that was taking care of her more than likely. That's more along the lines of what I was asking. Like, did it have to be a nurse in that specific unit or could it have been another nurse in, in like the maternity ward or something like that but we we were so strict so let's say because i i used to have residents in, in the pathology lab with me all the time and i would go they would say like hey nicole could you help me with this and then i would go and look at it but that specimen was assigned to them so i if they needed to look up if i would say like oh go and see if they had if they had some kind of imaging done i wouldn't look it up myself because the specimen wasn't assigned to me it was assigned to them they would look it up and then tell me what it said. Because if for whatever reason, like they could track all that because it's a computer, right? They could see who logged in, who looked at it. And then that would leave liability to me that they could come to me and say, why were you looking in that person's chart? You didn't do that specimen. And even though like I worked in the same room and obviously I was helping, it's just it's just better to just follow the rules in, in that respect. Well, so this isn't the first time she's been a victim of hospital breach. So in 2012, She had gone to the hospital for morning sickness, and uh, two Australian radio DJs pretended to be the king and Prince Charles, and or the queen and Prince Charles, and called the hospital asking for her information. Which, like, who's believing that they're directly calling? First of all, anyway, the the nurse that answered the phone patched them through to her department, who then gave them information about her, and the nurse who had initially received the phone call ended up hanging herself a couple days later oh my god that's i mean i can't imagine how horrible that she felt and it was probably really an an innocent mistake but didn't these djs like do that live on air or something yeah they broadcasted it which i'm sure contributed to her getting in trouble and you know i read that this is a criminal offense so you know you could potentially be facing up to jail we actually have another story coming up later where i want to make the point of why is it worth risking everything you have your job and possible criminal charges just to try to sell a story or have information well actually so this happened with another celebrity jesse smollett Mm -hmm. if if you remember that or smollett however you say his name he was you know whatever he did and he was in the hospital and everything but there was a thing that some of the employees there were looking at his chart that weren't directly involved with his care that also I, I mean, p- it, the thing is, is that it's just like this human curiosity, like right between your fingertips and the keyboard is access to the question that everybody wants to know the answer to. And it and you just have to c- cut the ties between that and just not be nosy. That's all it is, is it, it people that are nosy snoopers and stuff like like you and my mom. Maybe. I would never look you somebody's would be, information. I know, up but like you that. like. I just think that you guys are always like so. You're so gossipy. You want to know everything. So it's just I'm gossipy, but I understand privacy. 
You Except, are, but you are a rule follower, so that well, I'm would a rule follower it. too. But I'm not going to say that I haven't looked into, you know, friends potentially shady boyfriends before, right? So like, uh, I, but that's but we de- well, I'm we Google both searching their name. That. I'm not breaking into their works records and their criminal stuff. So yeah, I I definitely love the hot goss, but I'm never going <laughs> to violate somebody's privacy. All right, let's get on the other celebrity news. Days. Days of Our Lives star uh, Greg Vaughn had to rush to urgent care after getting hit with a really bad case of altitude sickness, which is increasingly becoming a fear of mine with my upcoming trip to the Rockies. So I I was thinking that, though, but you're you're not really going to uh, the top. I know that the the city in general has a higher altitude, but you're not really going to a a mountain to go skiing and stuff. I I think that you'll be fine just driving through. I believe when I looked it up, that the that Denver is at the same level as the peak of the Smoky Mountains. So, you know, we've had cabins pretty high up and I've been okay, so I feel like I'll be fine. But so the air so the reason that people get altitude sickness is because the higher up in the air you go, the the oxygen in the air decreases and it really can affect some people really bad. He I don't where is he from normally? Did it say? I don't think it's said, but he was on vacation in Breckenridge, Colorado, going skiing and snowboarding with his kids. Yeah. So, I I mean, and that's a typical thing to do is people go on a trip and they want to go skiing. And I guess maybe he's never done it or I'm not sure because, like I said, it affects people differently. But he thought that he had a cold at first and he was take he was having shortness of breath, but he was congested and he was actually taking like NyQuil and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then he realized that he wasn't feeling well and he was like, let me go get checked out. And when he, so, you know, when you go to urgent care or the doctor and they put that little thing on your finger. Yeah. So that's checking the oxygen in your blood, right? It's supposed to be between like 98 and a hundred, which is what yours usually is every single time you go. His was 54. Oh my God. Like they say if, even when COVID was happening and stuff, like you should check your, your oxygen they would say if it was below like 88, you you should go no, get it checked out. No, I thought it was out. below 95 they were telling you to go to the hospital. Yeah, I don't I don't know, but his was 54. So he was he was like on the train to dying if he didn't get help for this. So he had something that probably that is called HAPE, H A P E or high altitude pulmonary edema. And what happens is when your body starts getting starved of oxygen, your your blood starts creating more hemoglobin and it thickens up the blood. And then in turn, it's causing your heart to work harder to get that thickened blood through your body. And when your heart can't pump it out fast enough, it starts backing up into your lungs, causing fluid. And that's why he felt like he was having shortness of breath because he was like drowning in his own blood, essentially. Um, so the treatment is just going to a normal altitude and also getting oxygen. So he'll be fine from this. But if he stayed there, he he would have died. Yeah, I mean, it's super scary to think about, you know, I don't know if like, I guess he was saying he felt tired and congested, but the shortness of breath is probably what scared him the most, you know, because otherwise I would just be like, oh, I probably just have, you know, the, a cold or the flu yeah. or something. And he, mu- he must have had like massive shortness of breath if his, his oxygen was 54%. So um, we're glad he's all right. And I'm glad I love when, especially when celebrities talk about this kind of stuff, because it's just like added to the list of things we didn't think about all the time. And it, it could happen to anyone, really. Well, it's nice when celebrities take to social media to talk about real problems, not stupid shit. So, all right, freak accidents. Okay, so a woman had her hand amputated in this freak accident with a hairdryer. So a woman in South Carolina was in her bathroom about to blow dry her hair. You know, I feel like we could all be in this position. I certainly was right before doing the show. And she said she suddenly passed out and she wasn't found for 20 whole minutes until her significant other came in and found her. But basically, when she fell or maybe she turned the hairdryer on right before she fell, it fell with her and blew on her hand for the whole 20 minutes. Now, you know how hot hair dryers get. So this is oh, yeah. brutal. She had, she had third degree burns. She had, and so the degree burns are the first degree is the top layer of skin or the epidermis. Second layer is the dermis. And that that's like 
a sunburn or something a little bit more significant, but they can be pretty nasty too. And then third degree burn is when you start talking about getting skin grafts and stuff. And hers was all the way full thickness through her skin, soft tissue. And she said it even went down to her bone, which is totally probable in this situation. And she had to end up getting an amputation because the burn was so severe. It's it's the story's written and it's kind of funny to say, oh, she had to get her hand amputated by a hairdryer. But it it kind of is scary and it could happen to anyone. I, I want to know because she she looked young, just like Why'd she pass out? I don't I don't know why she passed out. They never really said anything. Well, also, I saw she was pushing for, you know, automatic shut off of hairdryer. And I understand that desire, but I I don't know how you would do that because like this is why this is in freak accident. Right. Because if sometimes it takes me 20 minutes to blow dry my hair and I'd be pissed if it shut off. Mine actually does shut off if it gets too hot. And it's happened a couple times if I'm curling my hair. But if I'm blow drying my hair, I'm going to be annoyed if it keeps shutting off at a certain temperature. Yeah, I mean, this. I'm sure, honestly, I'm sure this is not the first time something like this happened, maybe causing a burn on a person, but it could cause a a fire too, especially when if you're in a bathroom and you're using a hairdryer and it's an enclosed space, a hairdryer makes the room freaking hot sometimes. Yeah. And she could have already kind of been on the verge of passing out from whatever what's going on with her but i mean i bought some specific piece of crap hair dryer because it gets so hot because i i i need that for my hair in order for it to do anything and it could very well happen to me i, I suppose it and it is weird cuz i think irons and stuff have my iron has a a automatic shut off so i would just it is kind of weird that they don't have that as a safety feature honestly yeah well I guess what I'm getting at is I think if it was on, like, it could take an average person 20 minutes to blow out their hair. So if it was on for two hours, I'd understand it shutting off. Like, maybe they should shut off at a certain time. I don't know. But I feel like it was within a normal time well, frame to still think be about on. this. Like, her partner was there and found her after 20 minutes, right? You're home alone right now, right? Yeah. I mean, I would, obviously, I knew we were meeting up today, and I would eventually, if if I couldn't get a hold of you for a while, I'd be like, all right, I got to go drive over there, but it just, it takes me 20 minutes to get to your house. It might be an hour. Like, that could have, that could have turned into a fire if she had a vinyl floor or something nearby, like a towel. So, yeah, I think it's scary. Yeah, like, I agree they should shut off after a certain time, but I still think 20, like, I still see this happening even with that put in because you have to weigh the average time it takes a person to do their hair and you don't want it to keep shutting off but anyway okay on to this next story last month a woman was riding her bike in washington state when all of a sudden a cougar came out of the woods and attacked her and then a second cougar came out but she was able to scare that cougar off thank god her friends were there the whole time and it took them 15 minutes to get the cougar off of her. The whole time she was trying to choke the cougar, she was trying to poke its eyes, open its mouth open. I can't even imagine what I would do in this situation. I know. And it, they were saying that the cougar was like biting her head. Yeah. Like it had its teeth dug into her head. So you have to look at this story because there's two really crazy photos. One is her scars i mean when you look at her face you could see that she had some significant injury to her face because an animal bite that size is both blunt trauma and sharp trauma from the just the pure pressure and force of the teeth grinding down on the jaw as as well as the sharp teeth puncturing her face so i'm not sure exactly what injuries she had but it looks like she had some reconstructive surgery and everything but the the other striking photo is her friends have this cougar pinned underneath of a bicycle and (laughs) this picture is so insane it's it's insane like that they were able to do that i can't even catch my cat sometimes like (laughs) it's just it just is it's crazy it's a really unbelievable story honestly it's great that it that it worked out well they were saying the attack was like a solid 15 minutes how scary yeah i mean she suffered severe damage to the face and permanent nerve damage but at the end of the day she has her life and thank god her friends are there she was like if i was alone i'd be done i don't even know what i would have done so totally wild 
All right. Our next two stories have to do with people behind the wheel that shouldn't be behind the wheel. All right. So first, a two-year-old was standing near a taco stand in the parking lot of a gas station when she was suddenly hit by a car. So it turns out that this guy pulled his truck into the gas station, pulled up to the pump, got out, and went into the store. Meanwhile, his three-year-old was in the car seat in the back. So first, I'm like, who in in today's day and age, who's leaving a toddler in the back seat alone? There, there's there's three rules I could say that were broken right now. One, when you pull up to the gas station, you should turn your car off. I yes. never do, but you're supposed to. Number two. You shouldn't leave your car alone, alone, idling, unattended, even if there's no one in the car. You're not really, that would just be kind of stupid to just do because someone could just steal your car. Yeah. Uh, number three, you left a kid alone in the car by themselves, right? And you left it on, which is just, what do you think kids do when they get in a truck? The first thing they do is want to, especially if the gear shifts on the steering wheel, they want to pull it. Like, come on, that's exactly what happened. The kid pulled it down, and it went into reverse and ran over the kid. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what little kids do. You have to think like a little kid all the time, and the kid's three, so the kid could probably unbuckle their seatbelt themselves, you know? Yeah, and they're not paying attention because they're three years old. So, yeah, they they don't know any different. It's it's just like, it, and it's so terrible. Like, this this family lost their their little kid for something so stupid and... I, I just hate it. I, I, I hate that this stuff even would still happen. You well, know? it just was totally unnecessary to leave the kid unattended in the car. And then this horrible tragedy well, happens. And then, you know what I was thinking about? Is this a situation that, like, they keep secret from this three-year-old forever? Or does she grow up knowing that when she was a child, she killed another kid? Well, honestly, like, I hope that she gets taken away from her dad. Well, so hopefully I, I she assume. goes and gets gets adopted or is with people that actually care about her and her well-being. Because at first when I read the story, I thought he got out of the car and was pumping the gas. And in the time he was turned around putting like his card in there, that's when she climbed out. And I was like, oh, my God, that could happen to anybody, right? Yeah. But then when I read he went in the store, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, we exactly. all know the first rule is you never leave a child unattended and in he, the car. And he put two children in danger, the one that got killed, obviously, and his own that could have gotten kidnapped. And it seems like carjackings are up so much everywhere. Like, why would you ever leave a child in a car with the key in the car? It's just like, it's just dangerous on all levels and obviously did not end well. So it's really a shame this one family, you know, I mean, both both kids' lives are destroyed. One of them is dead and the other one is never going to have a normal life because either she's going to get taken away for her, from her parents or she's eventually going to have to come to terms as an adult with the fact that she killed somebody else. And how do you get over that, even if you were too young to remember it? And then this next story is is kind of along the same lines in in a way. It's, it's a 94-year-old person was driving a car and ran over a a pedestrian a 75 year old person and you just have to wonder as soon as you hear this you're like why is a 94 year old person driving that there's no rules and there's no laws as to when people need to hand in their driver's license and stop driving but we've known plenty having grandparents and everything else that they don't want to give up their driver's license and they should not be driving and it's so scary to think that there's lots of people driving around right now that really shouldn't be. I I can't even imagine. Like, I'm 44 and I barely could see now. I, can, I just can't imagine having, like, clear enough eyesight and, and wherewithal to be driving in, in another, another 50 years or something. It's just crazy. Yeah, because this 75-year-old woman was innocently crossing the crosswalk at a library and this 94-year-old, like, mows her down, drags her body 20 feet. And, you know, it's all because she didn't yield. She probably didn't see her, which is like, that's a huge problem. Well, according to the AARP, the average age people stop driving is 75. And there's also statistics that say that the the most car accidents happen over the age of 70. It, the other gr- age group that the most accidents happen is kids under 25 years old for obvious reasons, because they just started driving and they're distracted. And God only knows what it's going to be like in a generation of people that just all have phones driving. Right. But um, older people are obviously at more risk of getting injured during these accidents because they're old and frail. And and if they get a serious injury, they can die from it. But 
imagine living 75 years of your life and just dying this way again. I, I mean, it, it's hard to say because let's say that obviously this is probably somebody's parent or something. They might say like, hey, I tried to take away their license. You you can't. I, it doesn't seem like there's anything in place that you could really force anybody to do it. No. Which is which which is scary, honestly. I wonder if moving forward, if you know how there's like permits for teenagers, right? And remember they had those red stickers that the kids used to drive in Jersey? Oh yeah. For people not in Jersey, when I was getting my license, they wanted people that had their permit to put these red stickers on their license plate and you couldn't even go take the driver's exam without the red stickers. But then they found out like pedophiles were using them to track minors. So oh, that's great. That went away. Actually, it might still be. No, I haven't seen them in like years. So I'm assuming it went away. Anyway, I was heavily encouraged by my driving teachers not to use them. They were like, buy the stickers for the test and don't ever put them on your car again, oh, <laughs> which is right. insane. Anyway, I wonder if, you know, you have to renew your license every so many years. So I wonder if once you hit like 60 or something, that when you re- have to renew it at a certain point that you would have to go in person and then you get restricted versions of your license or they'll have to you'll have to take some type type of test to go forward to keep getting your license cuz think of uncle jim for example he's 90 and he drives but he's he, he's all there and he's with it but not all people are yeah and i listen i'm not st- i'm not going to stand up and vouch for him cuz i've never seen him drive okay but we know that he drives <laughs> Is he good? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. Right. He does fall a lot. So maybe it's it, not. Yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly. Okay, so this is the next story is a, a terrible freak work accident that, again, could happen to anyone. Well, a woman in Georgia died after she dropped an AirPod under a conveyor belt and got caught in a chain that moved the machine while she was reaching for it underneath. You know, what's really sad about this story is that her coworker was saying she dropped the AirPod and said, I'm going to wait until it's safe to reach and get it. And then he turned around and then all of a sudden she was stuck in the machine. So clearly she didn't wait, but she got her, it, the machine grabbed her arm, which ripped her in and the position she was in, nobody could help get her out. So they had to call maintenance to shut down the machine. And then when emergency responders got there, then they had to start cutting through the machine to get to her. She did have a pulse when they got there, but she ended up dying later from the injury. And it's just, it's really sad to think that just such an innocent task, like reaching down to get your earphone that fell out of your ear and then all of a sudden your life's over. Yeah. And the coworker is obviously traumatized, said there was a significant amount of blood, which makes me think that maybe the arm got, it got so squeezed in the mechanism of the machine that it caused her, like her brachial artery or something to to rupture and that's really why she died so even though she still had a pulse she probably lost so much blood by the time they were able to get her out of the machine because think of one of your major arteries being severed and then them calling maintenance to come turn it off and they couldn't and calling 911 and them coming and then cutting it that could have taken 15 20 minutes half hour who knows but by the time she got to the hospital they weren't able to save her it's just it is. It's just like your whole life, you're 21 years old and, and you died because you dropped your iPods. It's just, but she did say out loud, I'm going to wait until it's safe. So some sometimes you can't ignore that little voice inside you that's like, you know, she ignored the little voice that was telling her that it wasn't a good idea. Well, this isn't even comparable at all, but I just told you this right before we started recording. I was um, washing my knife after cooking dinner last night, literally staring at it like I should not be washing it this way, only for it milliseconds later to cut through the sponge, my gloves, and my finger. So it is definitely like yeah, I mean, it's, it's, obviously it's this human. Isn't the same we do thing it all the all, time. But... This is this is when I amputated my fingertip open in the furniture when I was like, I was taking one of those little what are those? Uh, things that wasn't a little. You you were using like a machete on. <laughs> No, I know. I'm saying that what are no, what are those little things that I was cutting off called? I I for, I I the zip ties. Oh, the I was zip cutting t- the I was I, I the the furniture we were we were trying to put furniture together outside for my bridal shower. <laughs> for Maria's bridal sh- shower, so it's all her fault. Actually, it's Ricky's fault because <laughs> Because he asked her to marry no, him. Actually, it's Gabe's fault because we asked him yeah, to because put the he, people yeah, together. Because he's he in school and he and he should have been putting the, together the furniture for us. 
Anyway, so we decided we, we were going to do it because we didn't want to wait for him. And it, there was zip ties around the furniture. So I, I, I said in my head, like, let me go out in the house and get a pair of scissors to cut these. And I had a knife outside that I used to open the cardboard box. And then I was like, like a steak knife. And I was like, nah, you know what? I'll just use this. And I slipped right off of it. And, and my I permanently damaged my finger forever. Like, Guys, it feels th- weird as we're sitting here. This is not a steak knife. This this knife <laughs> is like one you would use in the safari expedition to cut palm leaves down. I don't even I, understand I, where I you got big, it. St- I eat big steaks. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's so okay. ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> All right. Talk about this, right, not, this not, last This story. last one is not funny at all. A seven-year-old woman picked her grandchild up from school. They went back to her apartment building, and the elevator doors opened. She must have not paid attention, walked through the doors, and fell right down the shaft. So I want to say, luckily, they were on the first floor, so it seems like she only fell one story. Like, they were at least they weren't on the 15th floor, and then she fell down the whole shaft, oh my right? God. But, but she, I mean, but she's old and she had, she broke her, what does it say? She, she broke, broke her, her elbow, elbow and her stomach. And tore was, her stomach. Yeah. yeah. She tore her stomach, which if they're talking about her, did they, I don't know if she had like a laceration on her abdomen because sometimes people refer to that as their stomach or if like her actual organ, the stomach ruptured, that would be a more serious issue, obviously. You know what I was really scared about reading it too is so somebody, somebody saw, like neighbors saw it and were able to help and they got, the child was young, so they got the child to safety. But the child like was like, great. Like watched the whole entire thing. It's terrible. Yeah. So, you know, these neighbors were able to quickly get emergency workers there and everything. But my biggest fear thinking was like, what if somebody on the upper level called the elevator and then it went down and then it like crushed her? If it was down or was it could have been all the way down in the basement, right? Yeah, but then she would have fell on top of it. Yeah, I guess. I, I don't, don't know. Really, Regardless, I was, just, like, I was trying to ask Gabe, like, because the, the photograph in the article shows what would look like a typical like fire escape door for the elevator. But they're, all buildings have different kinds of elevators. Like the ones that we think of typically are the ones with the sliding doors. But it was the one that you would pull open the door. And Gabe was saying that they're supposed to have a safety mechanism on them that they don't open unless oh. the car is there. So, but this goes on to the rest of the story that all of the people interviewed were saying that that building has lots of problems with mold and and mice and everything else so they're saying and people have gotten stuck in the elevator before they've been complaining about it and nobody's done anything so it all goes together let me tell you i was at school one day and the photo floor was on the 15th floor in center city so one day the elevator comes and the door open and the elevator was like three inches below the opening. Oh, God, that is so scary. And I literally walked down all the steps. I was like, I am not getting on this thing. Something is clearly not right. Elevators are, are really scary. I remember when Gabe and I first started dating, we were in some elevator and it was a like a cream color paint inside and there was all these scuff marks on the ceiling and he said, do you know what that's from? And I said, I said, what? And he said, it's from people's shoes when we have to pull them out of the top. And I was like, what the fuck? So, and someone, actually at one of the hospitals I, wor- I worked at, it. The- so we have like cell- service elevators in the back just so you could bring dead bodies in and out and you don't have, like the normal people going in the hospital don't have to see that. And we, somebody working there, like one of the maintenance people were stuck in there all day and didn't have a phone on them. It was terrible. Like all day. Well, their whole phones shift. don't work in elevators a lot because it's, you know, yeah. it's all metal surrounded by concrete. It's not really but an they ideal. have they use They have like that alarm thing, but I don't, if, if you just hit the button that, that causes the alarm, if nobody hears the button because it's in the back of the hospital and it's a weekend and nobody's working... I don't know if it sends like an actual alert to someone in an older place, you know. I don't but, know. But then, uh, yeah, like Annette and I were just like, um, we're not going on that elevator alone anymore after this. Like that was too scary. No, I'd pass out. I don't even know. What I'd do. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Vampons. Guys, if you haven't heard of Vampons, it's probably the most genius marketing that I've ever seen in my life. 
Vampons are tampons that come in a box that is shaped like a coffin. So for those watching on YouTube, I have the box. It is super cute, genius marketing. They did this cute little design with two tampons to look like a cross. It's so cool. So the box says Dare to Bleed, number one US vampire recommended tampon brand. So they're so genius because when you go on their website, you know, it's, it talks all about the history of vampires and say that they've been in the business of blood for centuries. It is the most genius marketing scheme I've ever seen in my life. Not only that, but these are the chicest looking tampons I've ever seen in my life. So hold up one of them so everybody can yeah, see. So this is what they look like. They look like your typical tampon applicator with a wrapper on the outside, but it's black. And the reason that I love that so much is because normally if I ever, I carry a really small, like a belt bag or a small purse. And every time I go to use my credit card and pull out my wallet, I accidentally either like it's visible, a, a tampon applicator or pad wrapper, or I pull it out by accident and it falls on the floor. And normally they're just so ugly. They're like white with with fluorescent yellow and hot pink writing on it. And it's just it looks it looks so bad. And this just discreetly goes in your purse. It I love it so much. And it's just it's it's it matches every color that I usually wear. So I love it. Not only are they excellent for matching your aesthetic, but they also work absolutely incredible. So they have 30% better absorbency over standard organic cotton tampons. They're non-toxic. They're certified organic cotton and galaxy viscose. They are so, so, so awesome. Especially, you know, we're always talking about periods on here. I know it's kind of a taboo subject, but taboo is what we're about here at Mother Knows Death. So, you know, we like to get into all the nitty gritty. These are definitely awesome for those with a heavy flow. Or anybody in general that has a period, which is most of our listeners. So there's no reason you shouldn't be interested. You know, it's so awesome to have the packaging matched the inside of your purse. You don't have that awkward shame when you're just reaching in, like you said, to like get your credit card. It happens to me all the time. It's it's just like it's so embarrassing. Yeah, and I don't feel the need when I'm carrying my vampons to you know like hide it in my sleeve (laughs) because it's not so obvious what it is, but. Um, every box comes with 20 applicator tampons packaged in the reusable coffin box. They even offer refills at a discounted price. And they have a text to refill system. So you can scan the QR code on the box. You can go on their website and check that out. It's a really seamless system. And you definitely don't want to miss out on that. So you can visit vampons.xyz and use code MOTHERKNOWSDEATH for 10% off of your purchase. Thanks, vampons. All right, let's get started with violent crime. On one of our first episodes of Mother Knows Death, we talked about this case with Sam Haskell Jr. So he is the son of a famous Hollywood agent. We talked, he worked with our St. Dolly Parton, and she was getting dragged into the mix, and we were really bummed out about that. Though those that aren't familiar, um, he was the guy that infamously called a disposal company to take trash bags, quote, full of rocks. And when the trash company came to pick them up, they were presented with a human torso, dropped the bag box, back off at his house and then when the police came they discovered that he murdered his wife and dismembered her her parents are also missing which they believe that he killed them as well but their remains have yet to be found so basically new details of the wife her name's may lee her autopsies are coming out saying that she was likely bludgeoned shot and suffocated before being hacked up with power tools and that she was most likely alive when he decapitated her so I'm going to say what this is what happened when when they found her body in trash bags. I'm sure that she was it, it was the time after she was murdered. Right. So she was probably decomposed a little bit because she. Yeah. Was, OK, so she's a decomposing person inside of trash bags. So they what they're going to do is they open up the remains and they lay them all out and try to reconstruct. I mean, it sounds kind of gruesome, but they take all the body parts and lay it out on the autopsy table and try to reconstruct a human. And they look at all of the parts to see how the person died. And they so first they said that when when you're looking at dismemberment, you want to know, like, number one, what tool was used and they said that the margins of the bone were so smooth that it had to be some kind of a power tool. So you would see saw marks if a person was like using a manual saw, but because it was it was a power tool, it would be very smooth. So they know it was 
some kind of a sharp power tool, but they don't know exactly what. But the next thing that you do is look at the margins to see if the limbs and the head were cut off with before the person died or after the person died. And in this case, they didn't necessarily say that her head was the the articles written were weird. I think they didn't say that her head was definitely cut off when she was alive, but they said that they can't rule out that it was that it was cut off when she was still alive. So they're 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 basically like saying because sometimes you could look at it and say like, OK, there's no bleeding. That's what they look for to see if the heart was still beating. There's no bleeding at the margin here. So we could say, OK, this person was dead and then they got dismembered. But in this case, they they can't tell. So they're not saying it for sure. And that would just be even, you know, a more brutal death, honestly. And just b- based upon what they said, they didn't necessarily also say that all of those things happened to her. They just said that she could have been shot which I think is is actually crazy. They're saying she could have died from blunt force trauma or been shot or had a sharp force injury. So my assumption is that, or it said she could have possibly suffocated too. They 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 literally covered every single way you could kill a person. So my assumption is, is that her remains were really, decom- they were kind of decomposed and difficult to tell, but also just really, there was a lot of trauma to to the body and the body parts. And so bad that they weren't even able to really tell like exactly what what did it because she had to have had sharp injuries um to for them to say that i don't know what they're saying a possible gunshot maybe there was some trauma to the bone that they were unsure how that happened bruising hemorrhage things like that so um god it sa- it just sounds so brutal and and terrifying honestly yeah i mean i can't even imagine i I can't possibly understand where her parents' bodies might be. That's really concerning that they haven't found them yet. Well, that's another thing, too. So they, they've they said that they think that the bodies of her parents were also killed in a similar fashion and dismembered, which makes me think wherever they went to the scene and discovered that this happened, that there was so much blood, it looked like it had to come from more than one person. That's horrible. Yeah, it really is horrible. It's And, and they have they have little kids. Yeah, I mean, and these now, kids are and now be... like her parents are dead too. So like, I don't, I don't even know where the little kids are. But just, I always think about this. Like when children, especially when this day and age with the internet, and it's just so eagle, easy to Google search something. Like when these kids become twenty five years old, like what are, what are they going to think if they search their dad's name and this comes up? It's just like it's so, it's so sad to me that that people don't think about that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he was thinking about what was happening to his kids if he was in a murderous rage and killed three people, but I, I know, but like they're they're he'll go to jail or whatever and and they're they're left behind. It's just it's horrible to lose your mom, but then you lost your dad. They don't they're little, they don't really understand what happened to their dad, their grandparents, like everybody they knew. They had three adults living in their life, four adults, and now they have nothing. Like, it's just, it's terrible. Yeah. All right, next. Florida police received a call about a woman who was naked outside of her home. So when they arrived, they brought her into the house and she, quote, stood over what appeared to be a human organ. At the same time, another officer is going through her house trying to find her clothes to put on and comes upon her dead mother in another room with a trauma to her chest. That said it was consistent with an evisceration of the heart. Yeah. So then the organ ended up being identified as a heart. And she said that she killed her mother because she was, quote, mean and she wanted to inspect the heart. Yeah. That. So one of our listeners actually sent us this story. And I thank you. And please send in stories like this because this is this is a great one. Um. I, well, it's not so great for this lady, I guess, but. They said in some point in the article that it looked like she used to be a healthcare worker. So I was wondering if she had any knowledge of anatomy, because I'll tell you right now, if you just told if I told you to just take a heart out of a dead body, it wouldn't really be so easy for you to do that because of the rib cage there if you just had a knife. 
So I'm wondering how she knew where to go to get it out so cleanly. It's a little interesting to me. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Would it be easier to take it out of the back or the front? No, it would. I mean, it's just encased. It's encased in the rib cage for protection. It if um if I didn't have access to a bone saw, I feel like the best thing would be to just make. Why am I giving well, directions? Yeah, don't for give this? tips. What do you but do to it? make an incision underneath of the the bottom of the rib cage and just kind of stick my hand up there and get it out. But I would I would know how to do that. I have had to do that because there's been several times like when you get an autopsy. Sometimes the family members will say, oh, they have this incision on your chest and you have to do the whole autopsy through this this small little incision. So uh, there's been times where I've had to stick my arm like all the way up or inside a person to get the organ, but I know where they anatomically sit. Um, so I, I just don't really understand how she would do it unless she had a saw to cut through the bone or or. Even so, if she really knew the sweet spots to hit, sometimes you could cut in between the costochondral junction, which is like where the bone meets the uh, cartilage, and then you can get you can get through that with a blade sometimes. But it's it I don't know. It's just it's just a little yeah, a little you, sus. You just gotta cut through the junction, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was hospitalized in two thousand and nine for mental health issues, and it was kind of known amongst her family she had some issues. What confused me was she was pretty open with the police in her interviews that she killed the mother, but then pled not guilty. So I don't know what that's about, but maybe because she knows she could, or the lawyer knows she could get off with insanity. Because yeah, and and I mean, it it sounds like it's going down that road. All right, this next story has a lot of layers, so let me get through. <laughs> so. In January, this chick told her boyfriend of about a year that she was pregnant and she said he seemed overly supportive. So now this guy is facing several charges including rape and assault after he allegedly inserted several abortion pills into her while they were having sex. So this is, this is where it starts peeling back. So this guy was a nurse and... She didn't think this was the first time that he tried to induce an abortion, so she told police that after she told him she was pregnant, she he had tried to force her to drink a coffee, and she believed that coffee was drugged. The following day, they were having sex, and he was being abnormally aggressive and engaged in sexual activities he's never done before, which I don't know if that's a red flag for any woman, because men are pretty lazy, but (laughs) so that made her really uncomfortable. But basically, he was like, don't go to the bathroom. He was like holding her down, not letting her go to the bathroom. He told her to stay home for the rest of the day, which is super bizarre, right? So after he leaves, she goes to the bathroom and finds a little pill on the toilet paper and then later found another one wrapped in foil. I'm not sure if that one was inside of her as well or if she just found that around her house or in her bedroom later. But anyway, she confronted him about the pills and to which he at first denied having anything to do with them. And then he later admitted that those pills induced miscarriages. All right. You're leaving out a huge no, part I'm get, of the story. I'm getting there. You're, you're taking no. too long. So you're why? Driving, you're dri- no, no. So let me finish. So why would somebody do this, you ask? Because this dude was married and had five kids. All right. And he also was the nurse that was taking care of her. So that's how... She was he was considered his her primary care provider. And that is why he did something like this. And he was putting the abortion pill inside of her and which usually consists of 12 pills. And the best thing to do is to put it up inside the vagina. It causes it absorbs through the lining of the vagina and it causes a miscarriage, essentially. And that's what he was trying to do. If he had any education, he would know that one pill was probably not going to do anything. He told her he put four inside of her. All right. Well, four four would do would in would start it maybe, but you're really supposed to take four, and then wait a couple hours, and then take four again, and wait a couple hours, and then take four again, and and that's really going to get it all out, kind of. So, not saying that just four of them couldn't have done this but has induced an abortion on her but they said they didn't even say anything about it like she did they didn't say that she even had an abortion and i'm thinking that if one of them fell out at least 
then there was three in there and that was the only three she had, it probably it probably wasn't enough to cause anything. Okay, so after the confrontation, she stops talking to him, obviously, and he tries to pay her $2,000 to shut up. And then a couple days after that, his wife shows up at her house and tells her not to press charges because she doesn't want her whole life disrupted. Like, like she gives a shit, right? So then he keeps, so then she gets a protection order against him and he keeps showing up to the house, giving her gifts, professing his love. He finally gets arrested for violating the protection order and is released on $500,000 bond, which how many times do we have to talk about stalking and protection orders and people being allowed to be out, right? And then the char- the wife has also been charged with tampering a wit- with a witness. Like, what is going on with these people? I don't know. But she, like, why is the wife staying with this guy that she knows cheated on him and knows that tried to give this woman an abortion? Like, that's not some huge red flags for you? And my question was, did he go home and was like, I knocked up the woman I've been having an affair with and now I tried to give her abortion pills and now she's trying to expose me? Like how did the yeah how the wife find out? I don't. That's probably what he did. He probably like ran home. You you see that sometimes in people like people that I personally know that have cheated or something like that. It's like they they run to their wife like, "Mommy, I'm scared. What do I do? I'm in trouble." <laughs> it's like shut up, dude. Yeah, yeah. He like who is this dude? He sucks so bad. All right. Anyway, this. All right, so this next story. This guy was staying at his girlfriend Rhonda's house for a few days when one of her friends named Terry lured him into the kitchen and shot him. So together, Terry and Rhonda cleaned up the, quote, blatantly obvious evidence before stuffing this guy's dead body in Terry's trunk and driving to go get some ice cream with their kids. Because that's normal, right? When I first when I first opened this article, do you, do you want me to tell you what my first thought was? What? These people looked like faces of meth. Did you ever did you ever see that? That there was this like I don't know if it was a campaign or something, but it would show people like what they looked like before they took meth and what they took like looked like after they took meth, right? Yeah. And at, and then when I read at the bottom of the article that meth was involved, I was like, duh. The, do you know those ladies are my age, right? Yeah. Uh, like uh, look at it, it's it's insane. You know what's funny is I read they were your age, but it didn't really register with me until you just said it. Because <laughs> they look seventy five. Yeah, um, they. D- it's just it's it's insane. You really need to look at it. But d- d- go on about the story because there's there's even juicier parts to this. The day after the ice cream, Rhonda, Terry, and Terry's girlfriend return to Rhonda's house where they finish cleaning up, and while Terry and his girlfriend dismembered the body, put it in a fire pit and lit it on fire. So let me read some of these texts to you and see if this rings guilty at all. Rhonda, Terry, Kleenex or Clorox is not enough in here. It's everywhere. Terry, we need clothes in a hurry. We need both. We both smell like dead animal. Terry, already got more than half of him in the bags. Rhonda, just found a tooth in my blankets that a (laughs) one-year-old child has been on. Would you like it as a souvenir? And then, Rhonda, I'd never rat you out. Don't be a fucking moron. Terry, being too fucking paranoid to the point of obsession. Of course, blank needs to be cleaned, but you are taking it to a whole new level, and the blank in the fire can't even be seen. It's a four-letter blockout. I'm assuming it's for Dick or something. (laughs) But, or maybe his name. Um, but... Police were alerted to possible homicide, so as they approached the property, they noticed the fire pit burning, and, you know, he Terry said in his defense he was angry because the victim allegedly masturbated in front of his young daughters, and Terry's girlfriend admitted she was on meth and really angry at the time, so went along with it and further stabbed him in the chest. This is, this is what drugs will do to you, kids. It's just written all over this case, so... God, honestly, like that guy, if he was masturbating in front of a child, he kind of deserves to die. But like, let I guess people want to take the system into their own hands because the system doesn't do shit. I don't know. But I understand that. But just the way in which this was approached and then the text message, like the text messages are always, what are you doing? <laughs> what? Like, oh, I just found a tooth. <laughs> On a baby it, blanket. It, it's it's so great. I love that the text messages are kind of the best part of these cases. Oh, yeah, definitely. But, yeah, don't do meth. I think everybody could agree, especially if you're 40 and you look like you're 75. Oh, my God. Yeah, look, at the, look at this article and look at these people. All right, next. A person 
on the beach in Florida called police after noticing a couple was excessively drinking and then passed out on their beach chairs and their five and seven year old children were aimlessly wandering around with no supervision. So when the police got there, they noticed that people were unconscious. They had a really, and I'm saying unconscious as in like passed out drunk. They had a really hard time waking them up. And when they came to, they were like, where's your kids? And the guy points towards the ocean. Helpful, right? Um, Uh, Again, there's, in this article, there's a video of the, the whole police cam, which is amazing. So the kids are not in the ocean and they're just completely missing. So... Basically, like, the body cam shows them trying to wake them up and then the guy trying to run away <laughs> afterward, to which he tripped and then passed out from hitting the ground and then an ambulance had to come. And these cops are probably like, what clowns are these people? So the kids, thankfully, were later found, again, unattended at a local hotel pool. I'm like, how did they even get there? They, pr- they probably were on the beach of, of a, you know how... In like Ocean City or Atlantic City, it's like right on the beach. So you can just you could rent a room there and then you could walk right down to the beach. But there's also usually a pool right there. So they probably left that they're I don't know if they were originally on the beach with their parents and just wandered away to a pool. But they were at the pool unattended. They were what, five and seven years old? Yeah. Five and seven year old completely without parents at a swimming pool like thank god nothing happened to these kids because they could have drowned either in the ocean or the swimming pool and this guy wasn't their biological father but like what is the mother doing you know i mean she should she still sucks have, he should still have a responsibility being a step parent figure but like what are you both doing so they're both charged with child neglect and then the guy was charged with also having alcohol on the beach because you're not allowed yeah, to but drink alcohol on who the beach. cares they got they said that it comes with like a 500 hundred dollar fine and up to 60 days in jail, but he's already out of jail. I don't know if he's going to go back to court or whatever, but... Yeah, like, but they got custody taken. The kids got taken into custody and were transferred to a grandparent. That's not to say that the grandparent's not going to allow the parents around the kids, but they might not legally be allowed to live with the parents go- anymore. Good. Yeah. I mean, how how do you have to get... I understand wanting to be on vacation and having drinks, but why do you have to get so annihilated when your children are around? It's just yeah, so inappropriate. I, I don't under I don't understand it either. You can't like being a parent means that when you go to the beach, you can't relax for like fifteen years or something. Yeah, just like when you take that on. I was I feel like I was telling you that the other day. Like when like when Gabe and I get older, we look forward to just like driving down the beach one day and sitting on the on the beach and just like reading a book or something. But like that is not happening right now and it hasn't happened for a long time until they're old enough that we could say, "Okay, you guys can swim without us having to watch you like that." It's just it's and and all the other things that could happen too. It's just like it it's weird. All right, let's get on to some medical news. A mother is taking to TikTok to let everybody know that teens are using nutmeg to get high. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know it was a thing either, but apparently they're saying that these kids were getting their backpack searched at school, which I don't know why they were getting their backpack searched, but then they found a container of nutmeg in it, and they asked why they had the nutmeg, and they said they needed it for their cooking class. So then when they talked to the cooking teacher at the school they said they weren't doing anything with nutmeg discovered it was missing so the kids got in trouble for stealing it but then they also discovered that they were using it to get high so So, someone at the school probably knew about this because apparently when i looked it up it's it's a thing and actually there's been documentation of children and adults dying from getting poisoning from nutmeg it's insane i had no idea about this at all I know. I, I didn't either, but apparently it gives you kind of like a euphoric feeling and some hallucinogenic properties, but then all of a sudden shit starts getting bad and you start like thinking you're going to die and, and you could have really bad headaches, nausea, your heart race, and you could overdose on it. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's crazy to see that <laughs> nutmeg poisoning is a term and it's a thing that happens to people. Um, yeah, but they're saying a 14-year-old was rushed to the emergency room with severe agitation after ingesting three tablespoons of nutmeg for a TikTok nutmeg challenge. Let's all not do TikTok challenges because we've known through many, many stories and news articles that they're almost always a bad idea. I th- See, this is the shit that I hate about social media because I feel like 
Their technology is so good that they're able to block anybody from seeing certain things. Like when when something says TikTok challenge or challenge, they should just automatically flag all of those because are there any of them that are actually good? Like remember they did that stupid ice bo- the well it was for ALS, so I guess it wasn't stupid at the beginning, but the uh, ice bucket challenge or something. Like that's probably innocent enough, but some of these other ones are just, I mean, kids die from it. That's I'm pretty just the sure bottom line. somebody died from the ice bucket challenge. Yeah, I too. feel like they did too. I feel like we talked about that a while ago. Listen, I'd punch somebody in the face if they dumped ice water on my bed. <laughs> yeah, I I wouldn't be happy about it. No. It's okay, just... so let's 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 talk about this next one because this is like something that's right up Maria's alley, actually. <laughs> Ancestry DNA and 23andMe DNA are exposing the uncomfortable extent of incest in the U.S. So in 1975, a, psychi- a psychiatric textbook had put the rate of incest at about one in a million. But now that we have all this data coming from these at-home DNA tests, they're finding that the statistic is actually about one in 7,000, which is a crazy <laughs> jump. I, I mean, I guess most people aren't going to say like, oh, you know, one of my relatives is really my mom's brother or something like that. Like they or some, you know, anything crazy like that. But I think it is more common than you would know. And I, I think also sometimes that it's possible that people get together and just truly don't know, especially with divorce families and such and such. You just don't really know how closely related you actually are. Yeah. So you might ask like, I don't know. I, I, I've I never taken one of these, but I am interested in taking one because a lot of people take them to see if they have, you know, any anything running in their system, like any, what's the word I'm looking for? Like conditions? Yeah. Predis- that, well, well, this is, this is what, this is what the problem is with, with this. We've talked, we did a high profile dissection on inbreeding in the gross room. And one of the biggest problems with, with it is I think, I think often you would think a person that was inbred, like their eyes are a little too far apart and they look funny. And it's it's not really about that. It's more or they'll, they'll be born with three arms or all these things that people say. But what happens is the it increases the risk for genetic mutations. So sometimes if you could have a really bad genetic mutation, so you could have a gene that has the potential to do something really bad to your body, but nothing happens because you're just kind of a carrier of it. But like you because you need sometimes two copies in order to get the disease. But like if you have sex with someone else that's in your family that also has that co- they're a carrier of that copy. Now, all of a sudden, your baby is going to have two copies and is going to have that disease. So the further apart you are genetically, the better chance are that you're not going to have that. And genetic mutations can be anything from from systemic diseases that could that could cause death early to cancers and all sorts of things. So that's why it's really important that the genetic lines are not too close. Yeah, totally. And what I was getting at was like people don't take these tests to see if they're in an incestuous situation necessarily. They take them to find out you know, their their genetic history and their ethnicity and all of that, right? But then sometimes along the way, like in this article, you can discover that your high school boyfriend is your brother because you didn't know. Or um, this other Wait, guy- Wait, so do you think like, could you imagine the shower that you would want to take if you had sex with somebody and then found out that it was your brother later? Like, I just, I can't even imagine that. Ugh. I don't, I don't really know because- I mean, obviously, I've never been in that situation, so, like, I don't know. Well, you've never done the test, so Ricky might actually be related to you. That would I could be... say for certain he's not your brother, but <laughs> he might be one of your first cousins. Well, you know, what? that's what else I was thinking when this, when this person in this article was talking about that her high school boyfriend was her brother, because I'm like, okay, well... Nobody at all, like, e- let's say the child came out of an affair or something. Nobody was like, who is that? I don't know. Nobody made the connection is what I'm getting at. I don't know. It just, it's so bizarre. And why are they living in the same town? I don't know, but I know, I, I know stories. Okay. That's all I'm <laughs> going to say is I know people that this has happened to, believe it or not. So, so, and then I'll leave it, it at that. And then, <laughs> and then in another case, this guy 
really disturbingly said when he took it, he found out that his um that his parents were first degree relatives, meaning that they were either brother and sister or mother daughter or not mother daughter father daughter. So he's like that's disturbing. Yeah. So he's like now I have this disgusting feeling that my mom was a product of rape or incest or something like that and then who knows what you were explaining earlier what genetically he's going to be facing now because of being a new product of that right so it is really nuts um yeah we've talked about this before it's dangerous you know the royals are dabbling in this a little bit too they always have because they want to keep the bloodlines pure and whatever but it is crazy to think like i can't even fathom what it would be like to take a dna test and a find out that like one of you weren't my parents or like just well be like, i think i, I think have the little ding oh, like we found a we found a relative and then it's like oh my god like who my my only blood relative comes up on mine you know you know who oh but god. um <laughs> anyway it's it's it is just absolutely it's you know, I think that there was a lot of shady shit that used to go on before and a lot of people would have affairs and do this and that and just kind of sweep it under the rug. And now, like, never, ever envisioning that there would be such a thing that you would be able to test for this. So it's really interesting. It really it really is. I'm really fascinated by all of this because, you know, obviously when the 1975 statistics came out, they didn't have all this data. So and it's you know, I'm very interested in this and I haven't even taken the test yet. So think about how many people still haven't taken these tests and how much more data. It's actually probably more common than one in 7,000 because you have to think of all the people that haven't taken the test. Yeah, no, I know. That's the thing. Like, even with our family, as big as it is, and I went with one of the major companies, like I had it done and only one of my cousins is coming up, but it says this person, it attached and was just like, this person is your first cousin on your dad's side. Like it just, it's so insane how it picks it up like that, but no one else has attached to me. So it's, there are a lot of people that haven't done it and it's, it's just really interesting. So the number is surely to get closer. Actually, if you're looking for a present to get me at all, I would like one of the 23andMe kits. Okay. So keep it in the back of your head. Okay. I will. All right, a new exercise pill could be in the future. All right, so this this is cool. It actually is cool. Like, it sounds really bad at first, but I'm going to tell you because I was kind of like, oh, great, we we need this. So, like, <laughs> like everybody's, I need this. everybody's going to be taking, like, weight loss drugs and exercise pills, and, and th- nothing could go wrong, I swear. But uh, I guess they made this chemical that they figured out could mimic – what happens when you exercise and it could build and grow muscle cells. And I, at first I thought like, okay, you could just don't be lazy and go exercise if you want to exercise. But this is good for people like my dad, for instance. So he's older and he's got a uh, rheumatoid arthritis and he has a lot of problems. And he can't walk a whole lot. And that means he's not exercising at all, really, except to just get around a little tiny bit. But you get a condition that's like muscle wasting because you're not using your muscles normal, really just to get up and go to the bathroom and maybe walk around a little. So this drug is good for people like that or people that are even more disabled that aren't able to use their muscles. So that would be a good thing for this. The thing that I didn't like was I believe it was the doctor who was involved in creating this was just like, or you could just take it if you're lazy like me. And I'm like, please don't don't do that. Yeah, I mean, that's the first, that is immediately the first thing I thought reading this was that it was going to be for lazy people. You know, I I don't move much. I'm sitting at a computer most of the day, every day. I played pickleball on Sunday like the millennial I am, and my body hurts so bad, which is ridiculous because it's a sport for (laughs) 80-year-olds. But yeah, I can totally see how this will be abused in some capacity, but it is really awesome for, you know, people like Pop-Up that don't really have that much of a chance and... Yeah, can still get the I, health I, I like it for I like what I was reading about that for sure. All right, let's talk about this hand job. <laughs> so this was kind of the story I was referencing when we were talking about Kate Middleton's story, which is like, why would you risk something so severe for like really in the grand scheme of things, not that much money? So a Taiwanese man was hit with insurance fraud charges after allegedly trying to claim $1 million in payouts for a double amputation due to self-inflicted dry ice injuries. 
And this guy is a hand job because it was very easy to prove that he sat strapped in a chair with buckets of dry ice around his feet because the person that helped him took pictures of it. Idiots. <laughs> so he he goes to the hospital and says that he got in some kind of he, he got these injuries because he was riding his motorcycle or something, right? And then they looked back at the the day he said he was doing it, and the temperatures were only 43 to 62 degrees outside. So they were like, at the hospital, there's no way this guy has like stage four frostbite when it was that warm outside. And furthermore, they said that the injuries to his skin looked like he wasn't wearing any socks or shoes when it happened. So they started getting suspicious. And he also, again took out a bunch of insurance policies right before he did this. Yeah, five. Yeah, like th no red flags are going off there, right? Well, so yeah, so one of them paid him $7,000 and then the four others alerted police because he, like the time frame between him taking out the policies and his quote incident were too close together. So they had him look into it. Yes. Yeah, so they had he, them look into it. So he had such severe frostbite and you could imagine, because when you see the photo of him sitting with his legs in buckets of, of dry ice like this that are burning his skin, and he had to get both of his bottom of his legs amputated off. Like, good job, dude. So my question, was it worth losing okay. both of your, both of your, like, feet and then, you know, your mobility, your mobility and everything else and having your life change forever to try to get a million dollars, which we've talked about. We had a similar story a couple weeks ago. Is it worth permanently being disabled to get money that will really only last you like a couple of years? It's not like a lifetime payment. A million dollars today doesn't really get you far. There's a lot of inflation. <laughs> It would get you through like a week of groceries but right now. His friend, like seriously, it will. The groceries are so expensive right now. His friend said he was okay helping him do it because he thought a gang was after him. I'm like, oh, you both are idiots. <laughs> I wonder he, if the friend will get in trouble. And he's 24 years old. Like what? the, his entire, I mean, think about this. Like he could live to be a 75 year old person. I mean, granted with, with his level of intelligence, I'm not sure how long he's actually going to live, but. A fucking moron. Yeah, total moron. Okay, next a really sad story. An eight-year-old boy ate strawberries that he brought home from a school fundraiser. Later that night, he was showing signs of an allergic reaction. It appeared to be a rash at first, and his family gave him Benadryl, gave him a bath when the um when the symptoms weren't really going away. Then they brought him to the ER, but it seems like they were there in a record-breaking three-hour turnaround time before they were sent home, and then. The next morning, you know, they woke up and he was just unresponsive and was dead. I I really am was reading about this story, trying to figure out exactly what happened. And I, I don't know, to be honest with you, because there's something that you can get called biphasic anaphylaxis, which is like you have this initial reaction because anaphylaxis happens quickly after you're exposed. So you could have the initial reaction and then it could get treated, and then it could come back hours later, which you would think is probably what happened to him. But when he went to the hospital, I, I don't know if, if his symptoms were that severe that he was in anaphylaxis for the first time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Could so, it be because they gave him medication, though? But Benad Benadryl, I don't I, I don't think it it would be strong enough, but I, I really don't know because I'm not 100% sure with the treatment and everything like that. But when a person, the reason I'm saying this is because if a person does go in for anaphylaxis, which, I mean, they maybe should have been a little bit more cautious because he was having a an injury which required him to get medical attention they recommend that you keep the patients and observe them for at least four to six hours and up to 24 hours because of the rare risk of this recurring again, which is, I mean, they'll see when they do the autopsy if his throat has edema in it, which is like swelling and that's what happened, or he has fluid in his lungs or something. They'll be able to tell what happened at the autopsy, and we definitely will report back if we hear anything about that. Um, because that, that's kind of going to fall 
on the hospital, honestly, for because I would do the same exact thing. Like if if they if I brought the kids to the hospital and then they they were having an allergic reaction and they discharged us and said everything was okay and then we went home, I I would be like, okay, that was a little scary. Like let's go to bed, good good night sleep. I just wouldn't even. I I think any parent would just do the same thing, and it's just really upsetting and scary that that happened. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I mean, we probably won't get updates about this, but I'm sure if it was something other than an allergic reaction, we will, you know. Well, they they were trying to, I guess they did go to the hospital to talk to the people about what they saw, and they they feel really confident that it was due to an allergic reaction. And I think him getting the rash or the hives, I mean, that would make more sense. And no one else reported getting sick either. It's it's completely possible that he had an allergic reaction to it. People are allergic to strawberries. Like it's just, it's possible. It's just, it's just a freak. It's a freak thing. It just it's terrible for the parents. Terrible. Yeah. Okay. A twenty three year old woman is suing a nail salon in Portland, claiming that due to their poor hygiene practices, it gave her genital herpes. So she's saying. The, the way that the article is written is so crazy because you're like, wait a second. Like, yeah, how did that happen? I was like, what? So, so this, and this happens typically at every, like a lot of nail salons you go to, you're kind of like, all right, your practices do not look good. You, you know that uh, Lucia and you have had situations where we've gotten pedicures and you've gotten like infections in your well, toenails. It's and, that place near my house, which is disgusting. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I never had a problem there, honestly, but the, the only problem I had there. was them overcharging me, but re- regardless, um, the, so so what happened was this lady said that the drill bits, so that they're like metal little nail files that they put on the uh, the electric nail files or the drills, they they weren't sterilized and they were in an Altoids container, which I'm not really I'm not really sure if there's something that's supposed to be sitting in barbicide, but I I would I would guess that you probably should. But I don't think that you need to sterilize nail files, so I'm not sure. Think about this, though. So she also said that the nail tech wasn't wearing gloves, and I cannot tell you a single time I've gotten my nails done where they, like, I've never had a nail tech wear gloves when I've gotten my nails done. I've also, like you're saying, never, ever, ever seen the drill bit stored in any type of solution or seen them It's something that needs to be addressed, I think, because... um, I think I think like the cuticle nippers have to be because they they can draw blood, but we all know that the so nail can files the drill can too. Bits. Yeah, they do. They can and they do. And um, so apparently somebody had this lesion on their finger called a herpetic whitlow, which is herpes on on your finger, and it could be. It's usually caused by type one virus, which is the kind like when everybody thinks of herpes, they either think of cold sores on the lip or genital herpes. And you can really get herpes not only everywhere else on your skin if you have an open wound, but you also could get it internally in your brain and in your liver and everything else. So um, just not as common. You don't hear that. So type 1 is the one that's usually associated with oral herpes. And type 2 is the one that's associated with genital herpes. So these herpetic whitlows or these herpes lesions on the finger are usually type 1 or the oral type. But in like 40% of the cases, they could be type 2, which which is the the genital herpes type. And I mean, that could happen because you have a, an open wound on your finger and then you go touch a woman that's got genital herpes and then that herpes can get inside the wound on your finger. So that's how you get genital herpes on your finger. But at the nail salon, if they were using a dirty nail bit and hit somebody that had genital herpes on their finger, they can then transfer it to another person. Yeah. And she said before the appointment, she certainly did not have herpes. A couple days after the appointment is when the infection started on her finger. She started feeling sick. And then when she went to urgent care to get it checked out, they swabbed it. And that's when it came up positive to be herpes. Yeah. And that's that's how they would have seen it was type two at that time, too. Yeah. So it wasn't just some like far fetched. I have a blister on my finger and this is what it is. She actually went through the proper steps to get it checked out. And this nail salon was also previously fined in 2021 for not properly sterilizing their equipment. But the thing is, is like, how how do you prove that? I don't know how you could possibly prove that she can prove that 
she got swabbed. They probably swabbed it because they probably thought it was like a MRSA infection or something because those herpetic whitlows can look really nasty. Um, so they did. It was it was smart, though. They do have a very distinct appearance. So they did a viral culture on it and figured out what it was. But how is she going to prove that that's where she got it and she didn't pick it up that night? like doing something it's it's i i don't know if it's possible that she's going to actually be successful i don't i don't know how they're going to go about that but i'm really interested to see if this pans out and if she wins me me too because this could happen to anyone and really they i think when they do the regulations and stuff for nail salons the the electric drill is a fairly newer tool that's used and i don't know if they've updated since people started using those things yeah all right moving along this chick took a selfie when she was on a trip to new york and then noticed her eye was drooping a little bit so she booked an appointment with a doctor and it turns out that after an mri she found out that she had a brain tumor yeah so she was diagnosed with a tumor called a meningioma which is a benign tumor so it's not cancerous and they they rarely metastasize or spread elsewhere outside of the brain but the thing is, is that I, I actually just wrote a post in the grocery room about this last week, too, because it, just because a tumor is called benign doesn't mean that it that it can't kill you. And in the case that I showed in the grocery room, it was this 47 year old guy who just he was he seemed to be healthy and he died. And when they did the autopsy, everything looked fine. All his organs looked fine in his chest cavity and everything. And then when they took out his brain whoa, he had this huge meningioma in his brain that he didn't even know about. And when they went back to tell his family, they said his family was like, yeah, he was having really bad headaches for the past couple months leading up to this, but nothing was working. And that was it, though. He was completely fine otherwise. And how many of us could say we have headaches, right? Um, So she had this, she looked in, she did this selfie and was just like, wait, one side of my face looks like it's drooping. And and she went and got it checked out. And sure enough, she had this, this tumor. And the reason that it's so bad is because your brain is in your skull pretty tightly and there's not much room for something the size of a golf ball or the size of a baseball to, to be growing in. And what it does is that tumor will then compress the brain and it'll compress some of the vital structure. So depending on where the tumor is located can really be dependent on if it kills you or if you have symptoms. I'm thinking like if she was having one of her eyes droop, it might have been pressing on one of her nerves that's responsible for keeping your eyelids open and blinking and everything. So that's probably what happened with her. But it, it's it's good that she was aware that something wasn't right and went and got it checked out. Okay, next. In August 2023, this woman who is considered an otherwise healthy person decided to undergo an elective MRI full body scan. I believe, is this what we talked about with Kris Jenner before? Yeah, one of the Kardashians was just doing this. Just, I mean, this is why this lady was doing it. She's 70 years old and she just wanted to see if she had any little cancers that could have been caught before they became a big deal. Yeah, so she was shocked when the scan detected a large aneurysm in her pancreas area, which ultimately saved her life, even though she's never presented symptoms of having a problem. Yeah, so apparently when people have, it's kind of a more rare aneurysm. An aneurysm is a like a bulging of the artery wall. If you think about if you have a tire like on your bike or something and you see that little bubble pop out, that's an aneurysm of a tire. Um it's 64 percent of people so what happens when you have a tire that has a that has a bubble in it it's at risk for popping very easily if you have if it has minor trauma right so 64 percent of patients that are diagnosed with this end up coming in because the thing already ruptured and that's a problem because it's a, a major artery off of the aorta and it could cause someone to bleed to death yeah that's that's crazy i mean I know before you were taking a stance that these are unnecessary tests to get done, but I think if you're older, especially, they're pretty positive, like in this case. Yeah, I mean, listen, like if in a perfect world, everybody would be able to get these done, but there's also just like, oh, so you could just get it done because you have more money than other people. Like, I don't like that. Yeah, but let them do it if they want to do it. I don't know. All right. Other death news. So... This homeowner in Florida was doing some yard work, trying to get his property ready to rent. The house was undergoing renovations. 
So he's in the backyard when he discovered toes sticking out of the ground. So he runs inside to tell the woman working inside the house to call 911. The cops come and they said they observed two feet sticking up out of the ground. Out of the ground. The body was dug up, taken to the medical examiner's office. It has not been identified as of yet, and there's no word on the cause or manner of death. How yeah, did it get there? I don't know. He's like, how, who is this person on my property? I, I mean, cl- listen, like, clearly the guy was killed because why else would he be buried? Yeah. Like, he didn't bury himself, right? And they're saying that his toes were black, so they're thinking that they were saying that it was probably because he was decomposed. Who knows what the hell happened, but he certainly shouldn't have been there. Yeah, he certainly should have been there, and good luck renting that house now, because there's <laughs> pictures of it all over tied to this story. So I wanted to see pictures of the toes sticking out of the ground. Just There's just pictures of all the co- the police tents yeah. all over. The Boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on to question of the day. Every Friday on the at Mother Knows Death Instagram, we put up a little question box in the story so you guys can ask whatever you want. First, what are we doing at CrimeCon? We're doing a lot of stuff at CrimeCon. I have a lecture that's about an hour or two hours. I think it's an hour and then there's a little Q&A, Q&A and stuff. maybe a meet and greet after. Yeah, so I'm doing a, re- a cool lecture. I already wrote the outline out, so I think you guys will really like it. And um, we're doing a live episode like this, which I'm a little nervous about. I'm very how- nervous. <laughs> I'm just... I'm just nervous because we won't be in like our normal groove of the way that we do things. Um, but I, I'm not nervous about doing it in front of people. It's more just like, well, like we print our notes out right before we do this. Like, are we going to have access to a printer? Like, I'm, I can't use an iPad or something. Like, I need to have, I need to do things the same way every time or that they get screwed up. Yeah, we're going to have to figure out the logistics of this. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Call the hotel right now and be like, I need a printer. Well, it's a conference center, so I'm sure they have I, a I printer. I know, but just just like stupid stuff like that. But yeah, um, we're also, are we doing anything else? Yeah, we're doing some meet and greets, like book signing maybe. Like we, I don't, we don't have it 100%. Yeah, we're going to have a booth too. So you can stop by the booth and get some more information. We'll have information about the grocery room and, you know, we're still planning that out. So maybe we'll have a little game or something that you guys can. Yeah, I we don't know. We got to sit down and do that. Yeah. All right. Next, does an autopsy feel like a workout? Yeah, it does sometimes. Um, I remember the first time that I was learning how to take out someone's brain. It was it was like very difficult for me to use even just the bone saw because this you this saw does a lot of the work for you, but it's also just kind of heavy to hold it, and then you have to push through the bone at the same time, and it hurts your arm it's like it's like a workout and it could take it could take like 20 or 25 minutes or a half hour when you're first starting because it's just like it's just tedious to get through and then some people have thicker skulls than others and it's just hard and I remember my mentors always like me being like can you finish my arm hurts so bad and then now of course I could do it really fast but um yeah it it just depends especially if people weigh more because we have to bring them from the gurney to the autopsy table. Um, so, yeah, I would say so, especially in the summer, I would get really sweaty sometimes. And my uh, my shield always in the summer like fogs up because it's always like humid in Philly and just, yeah, it's a workout. All right. Last, what's your go to coffee order? I'm kind of off coffee right now. Well, like. You're drinking a lot of matcha though, which has caffeine in it. Yeah, I do. I, I'm I'm not off of it because of caffeine. I'm off of it because it seems to bother my stomach a little bit. I do have it once in a while, but like you're saying, if I went, like if I went to Starbucks or th- there's these two really good um, coffee shops in Cape May. When when Gabe and I go, I'll get like a a dirty chai. It's called so it's a chai latte with a shot of espresso in it. Um, and I, I never had one from Starbucks. Is it good? I don't like Starbucks chai, if I'm being honest. It's like too syrupy. Yeah. Like the, the one in Cape May is so good. Cause it's very, um, I don't even remember the name of that I don't place. love that place either. <laughs> I do. It's really spicy. Like it kind of burns. I love it. Um, I would drink that like every day if I could figure out how to make that. Um, I make like, gr- like matcha every day at my house though. Pretty good. So that's, that's what I drink every morning when I wake up. If I go to Dunkin', I will get a straight up 
like iced coffee, cream, and sugar, but that's mostly because I don't trust them to make anything else. Oh, you know what I love there is I get, um, they have this coconut syrup that's sugar free. I don't know. It's, it's, it doesn't have that weird stuff that makes you shit yourself in it. That's in all the sugar free stuff, but the coke, I will get the coconut syrup and that's really good. Um, and then if I go to Starbucks, I like, right now I really like the matcha with the lavender, um, cold foam, but they're putting so much lavender in it that I have to get the lightest option possible because it's disgusting otherwise. And then if I go to like a local coffee shop, I'll get whatever their specialty latte is because I like trying different flavors and stuff. But I love coffee a lot. I, I, <laughs> I'll have it once in a while. I just like, I don't know what happened. I lost my taste for it a couple years ago. I used to drink it like five times a day and now I'm kind of like, eh, once in a while. I hope that never happens to me because I love it so much. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much. Don't forget to go to doramater.shop to shop these new collection of shirts. Don't forget, once the shop closes, they will not be available again. So you definitely don't want to miss out. We'll be posting about it on social media and everything. And if you're a grocery member, you'll have links and all the info you need to need. You need to know, not need to need. Um, But yeah. So thank you, guys. Yeah. Don't forget to treat your vagina to some vampons. They're so amazing. No, seriously. I like, it's been such a treat having them in my bag. I don't, it's that weird, you know, it's that weird shame of, I always, like you said, every single time I pull something out of my purse, one falls out and it's always just the most wonderful <laughs> thing, which it shouldn't be, but it's just this weird. Why are the rappers so terrible? I don't know, but they're vampires. Like 80s. Has, no, but vampires have seriously figured it out because they're sleek. They match the lining of probably most purses. So it's not as obvious they're in there. And then you don't have to like awkwardly like stick it in your sleeve or your pocket trying to hide it because it just looks nice. It's just a simple black You know black what I like the box? It gives me that vibe of, you know, when you get like a new iPhone, like oh, a yeah. Mac product and you open it and the box is just so It has like, that like slow and, glide. Yeah. It's like <laughs> that really thick, nice box. Yeah. It's it not is like a, a really shitty nice like, like the other brands that it just, I don't know. I, I like it. Well, we've been loving them, so we hope you guys do too. Thank you so much. Thanks.